I just want to introduce Vera Marie Calandra. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Corey, for the introduction. I'm, I'm as Corey said, from the National Center for Padre Pio in Bartow. And Corey had invited us to come and talk a little bit about Padre Pio and our story and how the center came to be. My mother, Mrs. Vera Calandra, <clears throat> was given a book on Padre Pio a few years prior to me being born, and I am the one who received the grace. And she didn't need that book at that time. She didn't need Padre Pio in her life at that time because everything was great, married life was great, had children already, had a business in a very thriving Italian community in Norristown, where we are originally from, until she received the news that she was going to have her fifth of six children. And the fifth child, myself, was born with, as the doctor called it, massive urinary tract defects and just an anomaly. So they tried very hard to keep me alive after birth with many surgeries, as they put it, to keep me comfortable, as comfortable as could be. And my parents were going back and forth to the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, where I was immediately rushed right after birth and after being baptized. And back then, moms were in the hospital a few days longer than what they are now. So of course, mom didn't get to see me, but dad never left my side. <clears throat> Upon needing Padre Pio at that point, she decided that the shrines in Philadelphia just were not the answer. They were not hearing her prayers of, we need help, we need direction, we need a miracle, what are we gonna do, she's gonna die. They were very devoted to the Miraculous Metal Shrine in Philadelphia, to the St. Jude and John Newman shrines. So Pat, mom remembered that book that, that a gentleman had given her on that man on a mountain. The name of the book was called City on a Mountain. So one day she decided no one else you know, is hearing prayers. What are we going to do? The doctors told her we've made her as comfortable as we could. We had to remove her bladder. There was nothing more. It's time to just now take her home, as they put it, call the undertaker and start to make the arrangements. Vera is not going to last. Mom and dad did not accept that as an answer, thank God. <coughs> And she decided, I'm going to go take that book out, and just decided to read the book on Padre Pio that was given to her. And at that time, as she tells it, she said, I was just sitting in the chair and just meditating and praying and reading. And then all at once, she heard what she, today they call it a locution, but to her, it was just a voice in her heart and in her mind that said, Come quickly, bring your little girl to me, and do not delay. So she was reading the book on Padre Pio. She figured that must be the one who's calling me. And with that, she went to my father, and he's like, oh, Vera, we don't have the money to do this. How are we going to do this? I, you know, we have children at home. And actually, Mom had just given birth to the last of the children. My youngest sister, Christina, was about two weeks old at that time. They made it happen, they pulled it together. She went to my uncle and said, this is it, we need money, we're going to Italy, help us. And he did. And we were able to make that trip over to, over to Rome first. She did not know the language, it was herself, myself, Christina, and my brother, who was 11 years old at that time. And he was a big 11 year old, because at that time, of course, as they say, they didn't have uh, dis disposable diapers. Everyone was in cloth diapers. So Michael helped with luggage and she made her way from the airport in Rome to the train station was the only way again with no direction, did not know where San Giovanni Rotundo was and the fastest and only way to get there was from the train. So what should have been a five hour train ride to San Giovanni was more like a seven and a half to eight hour train ride to San Giovanni. Once in San Giovanni, well, the train doesn't take you to San Giovanni, it leaves you in the town below called Foggia. So then you have to get a taxi with luggage. So it took two taxis to get her then to up, to, up the mountain to San Giovanni Rotondo. 
she felt that this was it. She's here, she's gonna have this grand meeting with this man who lives in this friary on this mountain. None of it happened that way. She had many roadblocks along the way, as you can imagine, especially first and foremost being the end of August, beginning of September, no ice, very, very warm. So she made her way to what we call here now, it's like a bed and breakfast kind of a setting. They got the lodging and she made her way up, walked up the hill to the monastery. She was told to come back for when he was going to have mass. So the next day she went back, she was told to be at the monastery for four o'clock. Padre Pio said 5 a.m. mass. And then after that, he is wheeled through a corridor where they stand on either side and he's just wheeled right through. At that time, she had her visit with Padre Pio and he just simply was wheeled right past. And that was not good enough for her. She figured you brought me here across the ocean what do you want of me? Tell me what you want. My daughter's still sick. Now the infant was sick and she was sick. And more so, everyone was also very dehydrated. So she went back down to the, to the bed and breakfast. And the next day, she, she had my brother go up with two men to say, we want an appointment with Padre Pio. We need an appointment. We need a real conversation face to face. Of course, again, that did not happen. So the next day, when she went up, at this time she felt, that's it, I am, I'm mad now. I am just gonna unload on him. I have got to let him know, why did you drag me across the ocean? And she was ready. She was Italian with a temper and sick children. You're gonna do what you're gonna do, you're a mom. And this time, when Padre, she knelt in front, like all the women were told to kneel, everyone was. I guess maybe see a more eye level with Padre Pio because he was in a wheelchair. And at that time, when he wheeled right past her, the wheelchair abruptly stopped and their eyes locked. And everything was said between their hearts. And she said to him, make a miracle so that all will believe. I guess you can say he did. I am still here 50 plus years later. And she never forgot that promise to him. And the promise has grown into what it is today at the National Center for Padre Pio. 1969, she went over to say thank you to, well, let me back up. The doctors basically told her if she's alive when you get home, because they were dead set against me going across the ocean, bring her back and we'll see what's going on. And they did, and on December 11th, 1968, I had another um, x-ray, and that's where they just told mom and dad, took him into a room, and they says, we don't know what you did, but where I took her bladder out there is now a bladder. So just take her home, take her home. There's nothing more we can do and see how she's gonna progress. And I did, and on the train, on the plane ride home from Italy, was the first time I had eaten food in two and a half years. And mom said, then I knew something happened because you had never asked for food before that. So again, in 1969, we went back in Thanksgiving and mom told her, told the friars, you know, I made a promise, what can I do? What do I do from here? I need direction. And her direction to where we're at now was always completely by the friars. They says, okay, again, they thought, crazy woman, you're coming back to say thank you, nobody keeps a promise, you know, you only make your promises to God and whatnot. But every year after that, they couldn't get rid of her. She was given some leaflets on Padre Pio, and she started giving them out. People started writing to her. And actually, the other day, I had a woman come up, and her name was Rose. And she said, there was a woman here in 1972 and she talked about Padre Pio, and I think her name was Vera. And I said, that was my mom. <laughs> and so she's been all over the United States talking, and that's exactly what the friars told her to do, to talk about Padre Pio. Say your story, let people know that he is still alive and well. 
Many people ask, well, was your miracle attributed to him for the canonization? And no, it was not, because it was prior to his death. A few weeks after we got home, mom had the, the television on, and the news was a news flash, said that Padre Pio died. Then she fully understood what he said to her, come quickly and do not delay. As Padre Pio knew he was dying. If she would have not obeyed that locution, that voice, maybe none of this would have ever happened. So I thank you all, and maybe one day, the way we came out to Wisconsin, you'll come out and visit us. And again, the center is, Nick, would you mind handing me the relic? In Thanksgiving, to in Thanksgiving, and also for the work that we were doing at home, the friars knew that not many people could come across the ocean to see Padre Pio. So he had given, he had entrusted to mom, and now it's down into the family, the girls of us that still work at the center, to share with everyone the relics that, were, that we are the custodians of. So this is an actual glove of Padre Pio. And obviously you can see he has his gloves on in this picture. It is a first class relic as it does still have scabs of his wounds in it. They were not washed. So this is also for veneration over in your chapel yes. then? Um, it will be until it is time for Leonita, who retired from the center a few weeks ago from working there in 1981. And I said, you're not retiring. You don't belong in Georgia. You're coming back out. You're coming back out on the road for some road trips. So she graciously came also on this trip with us. <coughs> um, if anyone has any questions, Nick and I are here. But just know this will be on display until we go to the airport. Yes. So you said that even though the miracle occurred before he died, those miracles don't count for the canonization? Uh, okay, so the question was, even though the miracles happened, just looking for a clarification, the miracles that happened before Padre Pio died, they do not count um, in the investigation towards canonization, correct? No, they do not. It has to be after the saint or the soon-to-be saint recognized is after his death. And that's because what they're looking for, so somebody could do many, many miracles while they're alive. And the canonization process is trying to prove that the, that the person is in heaven interceding before God. Therefore, because technically you could have somebody who God was using to grant miracles while they were alive, and then let's say they had, before their death, they became into a state of moral sin, or you know they were no longer perfect before God. So therefore, it's proving that, yes, that that person is a canonized saint, meaning we're going to add them to the canon of, of saints because we're confident that they are, in fact, in heaven interceding before God. That makes sense. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that explanation. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, if you have a miracle with um, you after someone has died, who do you report those miracles to? Okay, so the question was, if you do have a miracle after someone's died, who would you report that miracle to? For Padre Pio's canonization, there was a priest that we knew very, very well, and he was the vice postulator for the cause, Father Gerardo de Flumery. And that is who we started collecting in America, because that was part of our work, was to make Padre Pio known, and then he became venerable and then beatified through the servant of God first. And that's when you start praying to for servant of God for graces. Um, again, Padre Pio was from San Giovanni. It was established there. I would say that each, if they're not connected, this person is not connected with a religious order, then it goes right to, like for us, like just say out of the blue, we said we're going to try and make mom a saint. We would collect the information and we would go to our local bishop for approval. That's how it has to go. It's all in steps. But for a religious, their order would begin that process.
So for example, I would say if, a, if, if they wanted to open a cause for Adele Bryce from, from here, then if you were praying for her intercession and you had report of, you, you know, you felt as though there was a miraculous intervention, then you would report it here to, um, to the shrine. And if it's someone from a religious order, like if there's a cause that is opened, sometimes you'll see a prayer card for that person and it would say, it'll actually say on it, please report any graces received to this specific person. So if there's a cause that's already open for someone's canonization, if you reach out to say that religious order or that diocese because the bishop would open the cause, they can tell you who to report that to. I know, for example, for um, Matt Talbot, if you've heard of him, he's in the, um, I happen to know the vice postulator for that cause. So he is actively seeking and investigating claims of miracles. So you would just try to get in touch with whomever you can. And, and if in doubt, the bishop from that diocese, because he would have had to have opened that cause and they can point you in the right direction. Any other questions? We could take General Padre Pio questions too, yes. Yes, yeah, so right now the, we have two relics with us. This one, as Vera explained, is a glove that he wore that has some of the blood inside, so it's a first-class relic. The other one is a piece of, it was cut from a larger piece of cloth that covers a, a side wound. We have one such large cloth that's over um, in our museum in Bartow, Pennsylvania, where you can see the blood and the fluid like, you know, on it. The piece that we have with the attestation that's with it, it could be a first class, meaning that it has the blood on it, or might be from a piece that's on there that maybe it doesn't. So it would be a second class relic then. Either way, um, I know I'm not quite answering your question exactly, but if you touch a rosary, a metal, a religious object to either this one or the second class one, if it's, if it's second, it becomes a third class relic. And they will both be over um, after we finish up today. They're both going to be over in the chapel. The other one with the side one is actually already over there, but we're going to take this one over there as well. And you'll be able to come forward. You'll be able to, um, whatever you would like, venerate it however you like or put objects on. And we'll be there through. through if we can't keep it till four today, that would be lovely. Okay, yep. So this one will be here until Vera has to go, probably around noon. The other one I'll be with um, over there with the, with the side wind one. That'll be there till four o'clock. Yes. This is kind of a general question, but the relic enclosed in a frame. It's not ever taken out of the frame and laid. I, I read stories of having it laid on patients and, and those patients being healed, but are you considering the same properties? It's just a matter of faith, correct? It, it's a great question. That is what actually um, the friars in Italy, I don't know if anyone's ever familiar with the story of Paul Walsh another young gentleman from the Ridley Park area in Pennsylvania. And actually he was in a very, very bad car accident where everything was crushed. He came out of the car, he was in a little, a little MG in the rain, and his body came out of the car, smashed against a tree, his, his brain was completely smashed. The mother again in desperation reached out, heard about Padre Pio, and at that time, this is back in the 80s, we were still in Norristown, not as big as we are today, and my father personally brought the glove to Padre Pio and it was always encased in plastic. It's always encased in something. Because anyone, um, mom, when mom did her traveling, she did bring relics with her and they were tampered with. They were like, at one time she brought a shawl of Padre Pio and someone cut the fringe off. So after that, that was just not gonna happen anymore and the friars are like, you need to keep them encased. It is your faith, it's what God wants for you. So whether it's under glass, in plastic, it's Padre Pio and it's what God wants in the end. Yeah, I, I saw somebody come into our center shortly after I started working there and there were about 15 people with them and they asked for, so if you go up there, we have another glove that's it's always in plastic, it's always behind the, the plexiglass and they asked for it and he sat with it and he held it and they were all crying and I said, all right, I gotta know what's, what's going on. He said, well, about four weeks ago, he came here he was uh, terminal stage four cancer. He sat, he prayed with this particular glove, again, completely encased, you know, doesn't come out. And then he went back and the doctor saw no sign of anything, he was completely healed. And the family was there to say thank you and to, and to pray with the relic. So the graces happen whether or not they're enclosed, not enclosed. Just like any smaller relic that you would see that's in a reliquary, 
that, you know, a small bone fragment of a saint, whatever it is, they're, they're always encased. So, yeah. Can you speak to the, um, to the miracles that were attributed to Padre Pio that facilitated his canonization? The question was, can we speak to the miracles um, for Padre Pio that were attributed to him that went towards his canonization? And I know for me, the answer is I should know more about it, but I don't. I know that one was particularly uh, a boy that was from San Giovanni Rotundo, um, where he was. Um, do you know what the other one was? It was a woman with cancer also. Was it cancer? I'm not, I'm I don't not sure. recall. But I will find out before the end of the day. I, I, <laughs> I have a definitive book with me on the studies, and I will find out and let you know. The little boy was, it was beyond pneumonia. It was just... What's the other one? It begins with an M. It's yes, meningitis. Oh yes, I remember. And they did not know what to do for him. The doctors at La Casa Hospital, Padre Pio's hospital, did and tried everything, and they basically said, I mean, his fever was breaking thermometers. Just take him home. There's nothing we can do. And again, he went to go and see Padre Pio, and the family prayed, and the doctor says, We don't. He's fine, and he was attributed. To be clear, not to see Padre Pio while he was alive. To right, visit this was after this his was body. Just a matter of years ago. Yeah, yeah he was beatified in 1999. Uh, he was canonized in 2002. And something that's really special for us is that because, so her mother, Vera, opened the cause for Padre Pio in the United States, and the center changed to become the cause for Padre Pio. And she was so instrumental in helping with that cause, uh, she got to know Pope John Paul II, who beatified and canonized her. And we have some pictures of her doing the reading, at the first reading at the Beatification Mass at St. Peter's uh, in 1999. So it's something special for us. Okay, so, so the question was, did, uh, did her mother Vera get to go and pray with Padre Pio while he was alive? Did they get to have a real conversation? No, the two times she saw Padre Pio, the first time, like I said, it was just a drive-by. The second time, it was through their hearts to make the, where she made her promise to him. They never spoke. He took his hand, and he knew what she wanted. He took his hand with the glove on it, and he just shoved it right up into her face, and she was able to kiss his hand. And he blessed all of us and touched all of us. And knowing what I know about Vera Calandra and the daughters, she had plenty to say. I was actually watching, you, if you go on YouTube and you YouTube Vera Calandra, um, you, there's a talk there. She's speaking at a place called Ivy Hall in Philadelphia. And you can hear her tell her encounter and the story herself. It's about a 45 minute uh, talk that's on there that I was, I was watching last night. She was fired up. She had plenty to say to that little friar about the journey that she had made. And what do you mean you're gonna do a drive by past me? We're gonna talk. She had, she had a, what I call a holy boldness, and that's why she was able to do what she did in spreading devotion. So God took advantage of that and used that. But believe me, she has plenty of things she wanted to say. But I think, I think the Holy Spirit just took over. And, yeah. and you know when it's God's will, because she, she was never trained in public speaking. You know, she graduated high school, was a mom, was a mom of six, and, and she did it. She went all over the place. I think the only state she was never in was um, Alaska and Utah. We even did Hawaii. They started the center in the Philippines with Father Alessio, who took care of Padre Pio the last 10 years of his life. So they were all over. They really, she did what she was called to do. She did, she fulfilled her promise. Literally till the day she passed away, August 19th, 2004, she was writing her talk for the museum, which was dedicated September 23rd, 2004. She was writing her talk for that, for that grand opening, that dedication, which she never saw. It, her story is remarkable as well. I mean, so she was, as I've got, gotten to learn more about Vera, just like Padre Pio got very, very little sleep, Vera Calandra seemed to get very, very little sleep, constantly corresponding with people, writing with people, um, you know, answering as much as she could herself. So there's many, there's great writings that we need to do a better job. When I came on board 18 months ago or so to the center and I said, all right, I want to see all, I want to hear the talks, I want to see the videos, and I want to see all the writings. And they were kind of like, 
you know, mom really kind of like didn't save them. We have them in newsletters and things. We can get them, you know, but she always put, of course, Padre Pio first. She wasn't thinking about her, herself or anybody's going to, you know, look at me or anything. Um, she lost her, she lost, she became, so I had to start wearing trifocals, you know, pretty early as a young person because she was constantly up doing the writing, doing the reading, uh, learning about as much as she could, which, you know, is fascinating. I want to point out, too, and I'm going to embarrass her, that we have a woman with us, Leonita Dowdy, who, who Vera was talked about, who we brought out of retirement to bring here. But when she met Vera in 1981, right, so Vera, uh, so Leonita worked very, very closely. She was really her sidekick. And um, she was not out, outgoing by nature, but when Vera said to her, Leonita, I'm being asked to speak in a lot of places. I can't go, you're gonna go. What do you mean I'm gonna go? You're gonna go. You've been listening for all this time, you're gonna go. So she, is, she, she wouldn't want me to call her this, but she's an expert. If you have questions about Padre Pio, pick her brain, because she, 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 she probably knows more about Padre Pio than anyone else alive in the United States right now. So take advantage of her while she's here, sorry. <laughs> Sure. Padre Pio the Stigmatist by um, Charles Mortimer Cardi. Padre Pio the True Story by Bernard Ruffin, who actually, he was the author. He was a Lutheran minister, and he came to know Padre Pio by traveling over to Italy. And he asked Padre Pio, what did he ask him? Do you want me to come, should I become Catholic? Should I become Catholic? And Padre Pio said, no, it's not for you. Continue to do what you are doing. And he was one of the number one bestsellers. We just lost him in May of this year. He's pretty Catholic, though. You go and you look at him, read his stuff, and look online. Like, I'm not sure he had anybody left who was Lutheran in his congregation. I mean, he, you read his book. I, I have the book, Padre Pio, The True Story, with me. And I, he's more Catholic than some Catholics I know. But, but yeah, he's His book he's is over in their gift shop. Okay. Yeah, that's a great one. It's so thoroughly researched. I'm about halfway through it just because I have to read every footnote. I mean, his, his sources of things are absolutely incredible. He's a really good scholar. The other two I think that are really good, um, the, the priest who traveled with, the Capuchin priest who traveled with her mother, his name's um, Father Alessio Parente, and she taught him English and he taught her Italian. And when she went over and said, well, what can I do? And they kind of gave her Father Alessia, right? And they traveled around together. And he was the one that he cared for Padre Pio for the last seven years of his life. So he observed so much. He wrote a book that Vera told him, you need to write this book. Um, pa, uh, that, what's it called with the angels? Holy Souls, Viva Padre Pio. And Holy Souls, Viva Padre Pio. And it's about Padre Pio's relationship with the Holy Souls. Padre Pio had a very, very close bond with the Holy Souls because he believed very much that if you pray to them, they're going to help you because they want to get out of purgatory. And Padre Pio once said, more holy souls climb that mountain in San Giovanni to see him than living people. Now, hundreds of thousands went to go see Padre Pio. Double it, triple it for the holy souls that went there to thank him. Yeah, so that one's, and the devotion to the holy souls, the two most important devotions, Padre Pio had many personal devotions, but the two he most encouraged to his spiritual children and the people who would come see him was the rosary and devotion of prayer for the holy souls. That's what he emphasized. So that book's really good, and then also Send Me Your Guardian Angel. Um, Father Alessio Vera also encouraged him to write that book because he had so many firsthand encounters of Padre Pio sitting and talking to his just talking to his, his angels. So he would try to remember as best he could to record the conversations going on. Padre Pio saw his guardian angel, uh, the Blessed Mother, and Jesus from the time he was very, very young. And when he got a little older, and his mother said that he thought everybody did because he saw them so frequently, he was surprised to find out not everybody did. So he had this very close relationship with his guardian angel. If you were a spiritual child, of, if you went to Padre Pio and he said, I will be your spiritual father, and let's say you're from New York, well, how, how is that going to work? He said, don't worry, send me your guardian angel. So he would say, send me your guardian angel, and I will communicate with you through the guardian angels. His guardian angel helped to protect him, to communicate with him, and he had a relationship with him. He called him Little One, and uh, one, of the, one of the really cute stories in Send Me Your Guardian Angel, Father Alessio was saying, he teased him. He called him Little One. Uh, he called him Little Boy, things like that, and his angel would get mad. Oh, don't get mad. You know I'm kidding. You know I'm kidding. You know, so he, was all, he had, this, he had uh, this super relationship with the uh, guardian angels and also very, very strong devotion to St. Michael. 
the archangel. If you went to visit Padre Pio, he sent almost everyone, he would say, go to uh, Monte Sant'Angelo, go to the mountain of the holy angels, which was about, a, for me, it was like a 35-minute cab ride where St. Michael, I won't go into the whole story, but St. Michael appeared and consecrated the cave and the altar, and you can still go there. St. Francis of Assisi went there, actually didn't feel worthy to enter. There's a little altar there with a sign. It says, uh, St. Francis of Assisi slept here. He didn't feel worthy to go beyond this point, and you're like, oh, okay, and I'm going to walk in and go to Mass. But, uh, but anyway, so he always encouraged that, go see St. Michael and come back to me. So that angels, I would really recommend those two books, which were by first-hand account, Father Alessio. And we have those. Can I get them anywhere else? No. Exclusively brought to you by the National Center for Padre Pio. Because <laughs> I think we have the only English translation of it. So. so by the holy souls, you mean the souls in purgatory? Yes. Okay. Yes. He couldn't emphasize enough how important that devotion was. Um, they, can't, they can pray for us. They can't pray for themselves. And they can only be released from purgatory through our prayers. And the angels themselves are a little angelology here. So the, so the angels themselves, I believe it's St. Thomas Aquinas uh, that taught that the angels are actually envious as much as they could be envious of us because we are able to offer up our own sufferings in union with Christ and our prayers for the holy souls. They can't, they can't do that anymore. The angels had a moment of free will at the time of their creation, and they chose one way or the other, and so they can't offer up those acts of reparation that, that, that we can offer up. And so Padre Pio had, very, very much emphasize that. Have you ever visited the monastery? And what was that like? You've been there a lot more than me. <laughs> I've been to San Giovanni Oops. hundreds of times, yes. When mom first started in her Thanksgiving trip, the promise was to do everything that she could. And we used to go over for summers and work. After school, we would go for three months and we would work over in Italy. So we really grew up with the friars that knew Padre Pio which was a huge blessing. And then my unsettling question, did they take the poor man up a couple of years ago and put him on? on I should repeat the question. Yes, in 2008. Let me repeat the question. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. So the question was, did they dig Padre Pio up a few years ago? Yes, um, March of 2008, they did, they did bring Padre Pio back up. His family, what was left of them, was dead set against it. Personally, me too, just leave them rest. Um, but they did, and that's when they, when they did the testing on Padre Pio for corrupt or incorrupt. When Padre Pio died, obviously he knew he was going to die. San Giovanni is, is just that, it's a mountain. And when they were digging his grave, he actually went and blessed it, and he said he didn't even want to be there, but they went forward with that as well. And because it was rocks, it was still so wet. When Padre Pio was buried, there were three coffins, the wooden coffin, an outer coffin, and then a larger concrete tomb, so to speak, like what we have here. But he was in seven to eight inches of water that never went away. When they dug him up, there was still water, and his body was perfect and, flex and flexible, the, the part that was laying in the water. They said it was perfectly soft, it, you know, what, you're, what happens when you're in water for so long. So, so we're, we're over on time, but we're going to be available all day long. Vera's going to be around till noon, so you'll either find us, two of us, uh, over, but there's a little table just inside the gift shop where we have our information and blessed oil and things, and then one of us, probably me, will also be over in the chapel. I'm here, like, all the time. I'm not as good as them, but um, we will be available to answer questions all day. So. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.